we're going to be looking at two wars that have impacted communities of color, the coronavirus and police brutality. It's no longer as hard to get vaccines as it once was, and yet our families overseas don't have access. Some of the biggest protests over police brutality in the city have been organized by Haitians. We are doing multimedia production around COVID-19 vaccine in multiple languages. Our news outlets are literally defending our communities. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Black, indigenous, and people of color-led media do work that other media simply don't do. Helping undocumented New Yorkers get vaccinated in Queens. Reporting on Haiti's low death toll from COVID-19. Those are just two examples, and that's just a taste. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we kick off a new monthly feature we're calling Meet the BIPOC Press. In the hosting chairs, Sarah Lomax-Reese and Mitra Kalita of U. URL Media. And stick around to the end for my two cents on buried black history and the revolutionary Memorial Day holiday that might have been. Hi, I'm Sarah Lomax Reese, co founder of URL Media and president and CEO of WURD Radio. Uh, we are here as a part of the Laura Flanders family once a month uh, to bring to you uh, information from the URL Media Network. URL stands for Uplift respect and love. And it's a new media organization where we have a network of BIPOC owned media organizations that have come together to share stories and to just bring a different perspective on news and information. And today we are going to be celebrating Memorial Day, but from a very different perspective. Memorial Day's origins date back to 1865 when a group of formerly enslaved Africans in Charleston, South Carolina, gathered less than a month after the Confederacy surrendered to mark the end of the Civil War. We're going to be looking at um, two wars that have impacted the whole world and disproportionately affected communities of color. And those wars are the coronavirus and uh, police brutality and systemic oppression. And so we're going to be talking with two of our URL media network partners, the Haitian Times and Sahan Journal, to talk about these, these um, twin pandemics, these twin issues, these twin wars. And very excited to um, be co-moderating and co-hosting this with my co-founder, Mitra Kalita. Thank you, Sarah, for setting us up and that history lesson that has a direct line to the present day. Memorial Day is also the psychological start of summer, and certainly in the US, it feels like we are ready for summer. Um, mask policies have been changed. People are back e eating indoors in restaurants. Um, offices are opening up. Um, so there's this weird normalcy that's been resuming, um, and I, I think Memorial Day weekend uh, will only hasten that. Um, and yet for some of us, this has been punctuated with our mobile phones teetering with friends who want to brunch uh, or get back together here in the US and WhatsApp messages perhaps from our families thousands of miles away overseas um, reporting on friends, family, relatives in places like India, Brazil, and Peru, uh, reports of COVID, desperate pleas for oxygen. Um, you know, in my case, certainly uh, the, the number of family members with COVID has crossed um, into the dozens. Um, so COVID is still very much a threat in one part of my life, even as this other part of my life, which is the day-to-day -day here in America, um, is very much focused on the reopening. Mukhtar, I'm hoping we can start with you. Sahan Journal was founded to cover immigrant communities and people of color in Minnesota. Um, I just wondered if you could take us a little bit through your founding story, and then we'll come to the present day. Uh, as you know, Minnesota is, uh, has a large population of immigrants and refugees and uh, people of color from different parts of the world. And uh, now they make up uh, about 20% of the total state population. But if you pick up the newspaper or tune into the radio, you um, get the sense that um, Minnesota is predominantly white, uh, almost, you know, 100%. So we really wanted to change that. We had um, 
the killing of George Floyd in, uh, you know, almost exactly a year ago. And then we have to pivot and change our, you know, coverage into really uh, bringing all the issues surrounding police brutality, civil rights, um, and, you know, how the communists were responding to what happened at the time. And we have seen, you know, uh, a convolution of really um, young people from diverse backgrounds, from, you know, the traditional African-Americans and the new African-Americans who are also really um, kind of joined hands and, and, you know, went out to really protest about things that were uh, affecting uh, their daily lives. Our audience has grown um, significantly since we have been, uh, you know, t- writing and covering those issues. Mukhtar, you said something that really um, was was interesting to me when you said, you know, there are African Americans and new African Americans. Speaking of the Liberians and and Somalis, and I'm curious if um, Black immigrants from Africa and other places see themselves as African-American. I I use that term because I think, you know, the more the community establishes its roots in in Minnesota, the more, you know, they, I think, identify with the uh, challenges and struggles that the Black African-American community really feel. Uh, And we have seen, you know, also uh, young Somali men being killed by the police. Uh, The case of Dolal Eid, just you know, a couple of months after George Floyd was killed, happened, and we have seen how everyone came out to really um, support the family and protest against the killing. So, Gary, I want to bring you in here because uh, Mukhtar mentioned um, that we've been seeing this for years, and you are the veteran, I believe, among us because the Haitian Times has been around for two decades, if I'm not mistaken. Can you talk a little bit about the police brutality as you've been covering it? I know as a journalist in New York, what I remember looking to the Haitian Times for a unique coverage on were the uh, death of Patrick Dorismond and then, of course, the brutality of Abner Louima. And I wonder how much of what Mukhtar just laid out is familiar to you and whether there was a similar evolution of the community that you've seen. So I want to first talk about his use of new African-Americans because ultimately you become that. Like my children are black, (laughs) they are Haitian, but they're not separating themselves from who they are because people, society would not give them any choice so they embrace it uh, rather eagerly. Uh, You saw that from from the Harlem Renaissance to today, whoever is the new group that comes in, first you separate, and then you look at the African-Americans as well, they are like me. The other thing that's familiar is the, the spate of police brutality, the consistency of, of, of murdering. The story sort of like that shocked the world before George Floyd was Abner Luna. Uh, he was sodomized inside a police precinct in Brooklyn, uh, really was left for dead. The NYPD has been under federal oversight <laughs> before because of these patterns. What Mukhtar and Gary have been talking about are you know, the, the police brutality and the the, the opposite side of that is police reform. And so we just had a very, very, um, you know, contentious DA's uh, race. And, and for, for Black Philadelphians, it felt like a repeat of the uh, presidential election. It was that important. We had this uh, very progressive uh, incumbent DA named Larry Krasner, who has been um, a real thorn in the fraternal order of police's side. He is gone against the establishment. He has really advocated for progressive policies. You know, it really came down to um, the Black community came out. Philadelphia has a Black population of almost 44%. He won handily. He won uh, 65% to 35%. The electorate was was smart and savvy enough to kind of see through the the, the narratives that were being advanced by by, uh, stakeholders like the FOP. And you know, it really felt very racialized as well. It's a similar story here in New York where um, kind of how much police reform uh, feels like it's on the ballot. And one of our leading candidates is Eric Adams, who is an African-American cop, which makes things very complicated. Um, Gary, I just wondered if you have thoughts on that, because I, th- I believe it was the Haitian Times. You recently did a story on how Haitians um, who are in the NYPD are also being elevated as precinct captains as they're trying to diversify not just the ranks of 
police officers, but also its leadership. And where, where, where does the Haitian community um, stand on this? We've had a very complicated relationship with the NYPD because we've had three of our country, fellow countrymen uh, victim by, of the NYPD. And some of the biggest protests over police brutality in the city uh, have been organized by Haitians. And now whenever you see a, a, a protest in, in, in New York, you see plenty of Haitian flags everywhere. But at the same time, I think, well, by and large, there's still an element of like respecting the police. From, especially from our elders, you know, from people from my parents' generation, you know, you didn't you know, talk back to the police or you, whatever the police said, you did. And so now we, we're transitioning to a, a place where we're taking a more critical look at the police, at the same time respecting policing, because we understand that, you know, as long as a society remains what it is, policing has a place in, in our society, but it has to be done not to the detriment of the community and has to be done with respect. And Adam uh, is, is trying to thread that same needle. I became a police officer to fix the system from within. I was recruited by elders to speak truth to injustice. I mean, he fancies himself and he was, to his credit, a very vocal critic of the NYPD from inside when he was a cop. I covered him when I was at the New York Times. So I think that's what he's trying to, to do right now. And, and we'll see it, whether or not that's successful. I wanted to see if we could kind of pivot to that, that, that other uh, war that we've all been uh, dealing with, which is COVID-19. And each of you, including you, Mitra, um, you know, have direct ties to countries and communities that are really still in the throes of uh, COVID-19. And I'm actually gonna start with you, Mitra, because Epicenter, your newsletter, has done amazing work around vaccine outreach and uh, COVID-19 um, awareness and education. Um, and you're also, you know, your family, you have, have direct family in India. So talk to us about what, what you're still navigating here in, in Queens, but also what you're, what you're hearing and experiencing with your family in India. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I, I do think it's it's related because there is this, uh, there are systems that are set up against our communities. And in so many ways, what we've just heard are our news outlets are picking up the baton of literally defending our communities. And so uh, COVID in many ways, Epicenter is very founding uh, here in Jackson Heights, Queens, where the epicenter of the epicenter as it's known, um, really is the result of looking around and asking the question, does anybody know how bad this is? Will anybody come? And then just communities trying to help each other. In more recent months, um, our community came to us, came to Epicenter. We had been working with a lot of small businesses and spotlighting their problems and their successes. And they said, well, restaurant workers qualify to get vaccinated. Can you help us navigate this? We don't know how to book vaccines because uh, in the kind of infinite wisdom of the vaccine rollout, everything was online. And so Epicenter began um, an effort and it was really by word of mouth with these restaurant workers, which then led to taxi drivers, which then led to elderly who uh, might not have access to, like I said, the internet. And um, as of yesterday, we've helped book uh, 5,037 vaccine appointments. And this really just started out as um, neighbors helping neighbors and it, it grew and grew and grew. That brings us to the present moment um, and what I sort of um, alluded to earlier of the schism that many of us are feeling where it's no longer as hard to get a vaccine appointment or even vaccines as it once was. And yet our families overseas don't have access um, and in many cases are dealing with second, even third surges. Um, this is really worrisome to me because it feels like it underscores so much of the systemic inequalities that we've been talking about. And um, it's not like we can't do something about it. So President Biden has supported sharing the patents and technology transfer with other countries. As a result of the situation that India is in right now, it's kind of saving its vaccines for its own people. But India is also the largest vaccine provider to the rest of the developing world. So we have this terrible domino effect where until Indians are vaccinated, does that mean that the rest of the world has to wait? And so if it sounds complicated, it really is. 
but it also means that we're not acting like we're one world. We're acting as though, oh, well, the U.S. is going to be okay, and therefore, you know, these variants and this threat is not going to come here. And I can tell you firsthand from here in the epicenter that that is absolutely not true. Mukhtar, you just recently uh, came back from Kenya. You you have family there, and you spent a few weeks there. Can you can you tell us like what what your experience was and what's happening um, on the continent, especially in Kenya. I went there a couple of weeks after I took my Pfizer shot, you know, so I was grateful to have that vaccine. But when I landed um, in Nairobi, the situation was completely different than, you know, what they have seen before. As you can tell, you know, Nairobi is one of the most populous, uh, you know, capital cities in the world, 4.2 million people. And um, the shocking part was, you know, the lack of social distancing in, in, you know, when you're going to the market or, you know, visiting people. I have seen um, a lot of, you know, deaths happening in, in Nairobi since I was there. My uncle uh, passed away. And when we went to the cemetery, uh, you can see a lot of, you know, other uh, burials happening around. So the situation was there was, was really bad. And uh, they were in the search of, you know, the third wave of coronavirus and there have been lockdowns during Michelle at night. By 8 p.m., you know, you won't see anyone uh, outside. But um, things were improving after I left and they extended the, uh, the curfew until 10 p.m. at night. Mukhtar, I'm so sorry to hear that. And it just invokes a situation we had this week where my uncle had been in the ICU with COVID and it was a really rough week because he's one of my closest uncles, my father's closest brother. He was released and I was kind of breathing easier. And then I got a WhatsApp message uh, from Gujarat, where my husband's family lives, that his cousin had passed. And then within minutes of that, I, you know, you really can't make this up. I got a message from another family group saying my aunt had just been taken to the hospital. And so I do feel like it's been quite relentless. And it's been months of this now. And so to not have access to the mm -hmm. vaccines, it's a glaring inequity. Um, and I, I just am surprised more people are not talking about it. I'm going to just turn to you, Gary, because as you as you listen to Mitra and, and Mukhtar, and, and I'm sure, you know, you are dealing with similar things with um, what's happening in Haiti and the communities that you're covering. And I'm, I'm wondering, like, how does this change how you cover this, this issue. Haiti for once give us a break. COVID hasn't done much damage to Haiti. And now the question is why? There's a lot of speculation, a lot of uh, scientists, experts who are heading down to trying to figure out what happened there. Although there's, some, there's a little bit of uptick in the numbers lately. As far as New York, you know, going back to your question about how we reported on it. Well, at first we tried to honor everyone when we pass, and then quickly we realized it was a stigma attached to having died of COVID, which shocked us at the, at the, at the newspaper because we never really at one moment felt there was any stigma attached to it. But because when the AIDS epidemic came about, they said that by the virtue of being Haitian, you were an AIDS carrier. And that really haunted a generation of young people in the schools having to deal with that. So people were very hesitant about identifying has been dead of, of COVID-related illness. I wanted to just see, as we get ready to wrap up, final thoughts from, from, from everyone. And if there are any big stories that you guys are following as your uh, newsrooms are, are looking at the landscape. Yeah, we are gearing up for the uh, one-year anniversary of the killing of George Floyd uh, on Tuesday. So as a newsroom, we always, you know, center the voices of the community. So we are trying to do something really unique in terms of um, identifying community members who can, you know, tell us how that they uh, impacted or changed their lives. On the coronavirus, you know, we are doing um, multimedia production around uh, COVID-19 vaccine in multiple languages, in Somali, Hmong, and Spanish. Uh, the idea is to really reach um, older folks who um, cannot, you know, read or write in English. And we are also covering, you know, issues happening from other countries and trying to make uh, the global local. Um, one of our latest stories is how the Indian community is, you know, fundraising and uh, providing supplemental oxygen for, you know, 
their families back home. So I think the two topics that we talked about is something that we cover daily, the coronavirus and uh, issues around police brutality and you know, racial justice. Well, for us, um, I, I, we are doing about an eight part series on the George Floyd, the aftermath of the George Floyd uh, uh, anniversary. Uh, one of them is that we're looking at the racial reckoning working uh, underway inside our community in our own community, like, you know, in the Haitian community, there are issues with colorism. And we, we want to hold up a mirror to ourselves and see where we are. We have an essay on immigrant pride, you know, in the way that, you know, people are saying, you know, essential workers are essential. Well, then, you know, now we're not, they're not doing us a favor anymore. <laughs> we matter. We're essential. We're important. So we want to take a look at that. We want to look at how policing is happening. In fact, we started it today with our story about this African burial ground and uh, on Church Avenue and, and Bedford Avenue and, and, and the history that's there. And we want to look at the way the policing is being done in the community. How are they profiling folks now? Because we know it's still happening. It's been very exciting, very tiring, but hey, this is why we went into this business school. As, uh, as, New, as New York opens up, uh, our labor market and small businesses are being upended like never before. I mean, this year has been a year. So we're really looking at um, what it takes to get a job right now. And um, just underemployment in the communities continues to be an issue. We just did a profile of a street vendor who used to be a pharmacist, lost his job in his home country, has been here. Uh, couldn't make ends meet and um, is now doing some street vending work as a, um, he's selling masks. Um, and then we'll continue to do outreach on vaccines. Um, the obstacles remain great to get a vaccine in New York, especially if you're undocumented. Um, so we've just been trying to let people know it's free, you don't need your immigration papers, and um, it is plentiful. So we'll continue to get that message out there. Yeah, and, and WURD, we are um, May 31st through June 1 is the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race riot. And so we are going to be covering that and, and really um, connecting it with the other major uh, government sanctioned bombing of an American um, city, which was the MOVE bombing in West Philadelphia in 1985. I, I just want to like really um, celebrate this overall conversation because it really points to um, what we at URL Media and these uh, BIPOC media organizations are doing, covering different stories differently than, uh, than the mainstream media. And I think it's really important for our, our stories to kind of be heard and, and uh, get some visibility. And so I wanna thank everyone um, for the conversation. Gary Pierre Pierre uh, from the Haitian Times, Mukhtar Ibrahim, from Sahan Journal and my co-host and co-founder, Mitra Kalita um, with uh, Epicenter and URL Media. And I'm Sarah Lomax Reese, um, co-founder of URL Media and uh, president and CEO of WURD. Different stories told differently make a difference. Just consider that story about Memorial Day. It was 1865 in May in Charleston, South Carolina, that it had its roots. A full week before President Lincoln declared an end to the Civil War, black people in Charleston were already celebrating the defeat of Robert E. Lee. On May 1st, 1865, they paraded up to a new Union cemetery where black troops who'd been buried in a mass grave had been reburied by black workmen properly. On May 1st, 10,000 black troops troops with children singing at their front and women with arms full of flowers and reeds and crosses to decorate the graves went up to the new cemetery and performed a solemn dedication. After decorating the graves, they picnicked and partied and watched their troops, their victorious troops, parade. It was as David Blight, the Yale historian who found the original records and wrote them up in a book in 2001, wrote, as if the blacks were really marking an Independence Day for the second American Revolution, a revolution from the idea of a superior 
white race. And just think about it, since 1865, we could have been celebrating that holiday and celebrating our independence from that idea. Instead, white media, starting in the South and Reconstruction, rewrote the story in their newspapers and everywhere, and we've been basically fighting the Civil War ever since. Now, a pandemic's reminding us that no race is immune from a virus. This is one world, and we better start acting like it. Maybe we could start with this Memorial Day. Thanks for joining our special Meet the BIPOC Press edition of the Laura Flanders Show. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. I'm Laura Flanders.